Hey y'all. Anybody here for the sound clinic? Okay, good, because it's not here. No. I uh, hope we'll have a little bit of fun. Um, who's here from church? Who's here from church? Who plays in the band? Okay. And um, who's rock and rollers? Anybody rock and rollers? No? Okay, cool. Well, there's some some musician jokes will be told. We'll we'll pull the uh, we're gonna pull the curtain back a little bit on some of the jokes, but hopefully we'll all learn something, have a little bit of fun, um, and learn a little bit more about all this gear that's sitting up here, and um, try to make us better sound people. A little bit about me. I've been doing this for about 30 years. Um, I worked for Yamaha for almost 25. Um, my job is to help design these products. So a lot of what goes into these is stuff you guys have told us over the years needs to happen in these um, in these pieces of gear. So a lot of this stuff that you see here was from people asking, well geez why don't you guys do this? Well it'd be nice if you did that, you know? So um, what we tried to do here tonight, um, I want to build a system for you so you understand the basics of what a sound system is or are. And, um, and then once we put it together, then you can start to understand the idea of, well, geez, uh, uh, maybe an amplifier and a speaker together, well, that's a powered speaker. Or an amplifier inside a mixer, well, that's a powered mixer. Then you can understand why you would have all these parts in your system. And then we'll add things. I'm going to add an EQ. I'll show you how that works. Um, and we'll kind of go from there. When you look at one of these big boards like this, um, it's not... It, it shouldn't be a daunting task. Whenever you look at something like this, you got to break this down and look at it as a whole bunch of strips. It's not, it's not hard to learn. So once we start going through it, it'll be real easy to break it down. And so if you have a mixer that's this big or a mixer this big, they're all the same. It's just more. You know, it has more, more knobs. So we'll go through it. And, um, but first, I wanted to kind of get you... Um, acclimated to the basics of sound. And the very first thing all of us in here have to do as sound people is make the talker or the singer comfortable. Because if I'm going to talk to you like this, it doesn't matter how good a sound system you got. You can't pick me up. So if I'm comfortable on stage and I'll sing out for you, if I'm a child or an older person who doesn't come up on stage a lot, if I'm comfortable talking at my regular levels, then it's always going to be better for you as a sound guy, because the more energy you can get into your microphone, the better it is for you. I'll give you some tips that you can take home tonight. You'll be able to use them on the weekend. The very first tip, get the microphones as close to the source as you can. The closer you move the mic to the source, the more energy you get into the microphone. The more energy you get into the microphone, more volume before feedback. And that's what we all don't want. You know, we want to avoid that. This uh, lapel mic that I'm wearing isn't something we'd use in live sound so much. It's really more for recording and for uh, video, things like that. So that's what this is for. Um, today we're going to talk more about live sound. Because there's two different ways of thinking about audio. There's recording, where you're wanting to get everything in the room, right? You want to get the sound of the room and the guitar or the piano. And, and you want that warmth of everything. That's important in recording. In live sound, a microphone is only supposed to pick up the thing you have it pointed at. In the old days, when Frank Sinatra and those guys sang, there were three mics. There were two for the orchestra and one for him. Because microphones had these funky pickup patterns and they picked up sound from every direction. So they couldn't have all the mics that they have on stage like they do now. So a lot of that is, as mics have gotten better, they've been able to do you know, things uh, differently. So anyway, the very first thing is, is getting the source to be comfortable on stage. I'll show you some techniques as we go forward on that as well. Um, as far as microphones go, there's, um, there's all different kinds of mics. There's, um, there's this kind that's a handheld with a ball on it. You probably most of you guys have seen these. One of the more um, famous microphones, Shure makes this. It's uh, the most common microphone on, in the world. It's a SM58, and it's a handheld microphone. And Shure pioneered the idea that a microphone would be used to pick up a single thing. 
So that's why I talk about them. Also, they're rugged. They, you can do that with an SM58. You can go drive a nail with it and it'll still work. If you try that with one of these recording microphones, uh, they show me the front door right now. So, you know, the, the more fragile things you use for more fragile recording, for, um, for more fragile uh, instruments, things like pianos or guitars. But for vocals, you're going to want something that's going to be able to be handled and dealt and beat up. While I'm on the subject of that, if you've got microphones in your system, they're yours. They're the, they're the performer's mic. If you have five or six microphones and you keep handing them out to every other person each time they use them, the possibility of germs being carried between people is high. Also, any of you have ladies that sing in your microphones? You see all the lipstick that builds up in the, in the um, windscreen. You'll see them. I've seen them so red inside there and caked over. Well, you'll, you'll fix the sound with the EQ because it actually sounds different with all that lipstick in there. And then you don't want to give that to Harry. You want to make sure this is always for the lady. Buy the extra parts. Once in a while, you know, if they get banged up, get extra parts and fix them. But don't be afraid to clean these. They actually have a little kit so you can keep them clean and uh, protect, you know, yourselves uh, against catching something off the microphone. Another thing is, any of you do the, any work outside? Um, I mean, we talk a little bit about how wind noise picks up in microphones. You'll see wind screens, that's what they call this. But they also make a foam windscreen that goes over the mics. And one of the cool tricks is they've got them back there that are different colors. So if you happen to do a festival or something where you don't know who's picking up what mic, then you'll know a green one is always marked green on your board. So, so um, this microphone that I'm using right now, this lavalier that they've got me using for recording, is one you guys want to try to avoid. It goes right against the very first rule I gave you. Moving this further from me is less energy and more chance of picking up feedback. So what would be better would be to have that microphone up near my face. And since I'm, I want to keep my hands free, a head-worn mic might be a really good idea. Have you seen the ones that are, um, they've got, uh, these guys carry this one from Shure. This is kind of a, more of an industrial one, more like a, somebody, an aerobics instructor or something might use. But uh, it's all taped over because it's brand new. But this goes around behind your neck and would, uh, there, would, um, you know, so you could wear it this way and then aim this directly at your, your source, which would be the speaker. Um, th the reason for this is just to get it close to me and I'm never going to pull the mic away. I can't do that. If you get the, uh, the kind that are hidden, the little ones that are the flesh colored, um, they're actually even lighter weight and you'll forget you even have them on. Uh, a lot of people who speak with their hands uh, would love that. But these are expandables. These break. They got little wires um, and they, you know, they're a personal item that you tend to bend around a lot. It's eventually going to break. So you got to kind of plan for that. Whereas an SM58 will last almost forever. These are things that have a lifetime. So consider these if you've got somebody and you're trying to get them, get good sound from them, and they're good talkers, but they use their hands all the time and they won't stay near that mic. Anybody use a podium mic? Anybody got a podium with it? That's good, because those are usually a little tiny mic like this on a little stick. Yeah, they're a real drag to try to get to sound good if you've got somebody who won't stand still or they keep leaning away from the podium or turning pages when they're talking. Um, a little secret, you ever see uh, Bill Gates? He always has two microphones in front of him or if Obama talks, there's always three microphones right in front of him. You know how many of those mics are on? Just one. The other two or the other one is a spare. They know it's so important that they don't want to lose his vocal that they want to be able to switch to something else. You never want too many microphones in one place. Sound travels slow. It gets from my uh, mouth to the microphone at a certain amount of time. If there was another open microphone over here, it would travel over there too. But it would travel over there and it would take longer because it's further away. And that would cause interference between the two microphones. So there is a three to one rule. 
and that's why these head-worn microphones work so well. Three times the distance, if, if you have a microphone that's within a foot of a person, it would better be three feet before you put the next microphone. So you'll see guys on stage, they'll be singing, and they may sing a duet together, and both of them will share a microphone. That actually sounds better than having two microphones real, real close together. So a lot of times, one mic is always better than, than having two when they're that close together. All right? The third thing you can learn from microphones, any microphone you have on stage you're not using, turn it off. Turn it off at the console. Don't leave them on. The more mics you open up, the lower your gain or volume before feedback happens. And we all are fighting that, you know, I want a little bit more and it's always right on the verge of feeding back. The easiest way to do that is turn off mics you don't need. So if they, anybody use choir mics that are hanging, mics, that sort of thing, again, they're, they're too far away from the source and people tend to turn them up with the mixer and then they're picking up the actual sound from the speakers. Um, while I'm on the subject of uh, microphones, Almost everybody wants to do wireless. Um, this is an awful lot of money to pay to get rid of a one $20 wire. But um, if you're wanting to do wireless, spend money. Get decent ones, because if you get cheap ones, that's what you'll get. Also, for every one of those you have, make sure you keep one of these, because you'll never know when somebody will forget that one, drop it, whatever, that sort of thing. The other problem that you have with the wireless is you never know when the battery was changed. You, you changed it last week, right? Oh, but when I picked it up, it was a still on from last week. So we don't, you have to assume every time you touch one of these that it's got a dead battery in it. So you will forever have <laughs> um, Costco to thank for going to get AA batteries. Uh, but you'll, you know, forever you'll have that problem. And these are an expendable just like the head-worn mic. They wear out. People drop them, bump them around. That sort of thing can be a, a real problem. If you guys are doing audio off stage, where you're the sound person and there's people on your stage, avoid microphones with switches on them. What are the chances the switch is going to be off when I walk up to use the mic? half 50 50 shot that it's not going to work if you can't get rid of the mic go get some tape and tape these on at least you know for sure it's going to be on when the talent walks up there to use it because it they all everybody looks back at you they'll all say it's your fault and you're like turn the mic on you know it's up there so again doesn't cost much tape the switches on whoops Sign there. So that covers a lot about what a microphone does. The very next place a microphone, once the signal goes into a microphone, it becomes electric. It's a signal, electrical signal, it's no longer audio. So it's easy for all this gear to start working with the electrical signal. And frankly, this is the simplest part of the sound system because it's just electrical signals. And I'm going to show you how to set up the sound system without even having to listen to it and getting it to sound perfect. So the most important knob on any mixer you guys have, anybody have a Mackie mixer? Yamaha mixers? All Yamahas? Anybody else? What other brand? Oh, Personas, okay, good, okay, all right. Well, I just wanna know because color codes change between the models and I wanna make sure I, I tell you the right colors. On a Yamaha, all the uh, knobs for head amps are white. On your Presonus over there, those trim controls are gray. They're up at the top. Um, but anyway, this might be the most important control on your whole board. Digital, analog, doesn't really matter. If you don't set this properly and get a good clean signal coming into your system, then it's going to be either distorted or not enough signal for the rest of the system. So if you can set this, you're in like Flynn. So, um, 